name is Kirsten Stewart. I direct the Washington, D.C. Office of Futures Without Violence. We are formerly the Family Violence Prevention Fund, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to this briefing on behalf of the National Task Force and Sexual and Domestic Violence Against Women. The Task Force is a large and diverse coalition of hundreds of national, tribal, state, territorial, and local organizations that work collectively to prevent and respond to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Collectively, we represent thousands of programs and truly millions of victims of these war crimes throughout the United States and the territories. Today, we are here to discuss one of our nation's most important tools in responding to violence against women, the Violence Against Women Act, VAWA as it's known to many of us. VAWA is one of our nation's truly great policy successes. First passed in 1994, VAWA was most recently reauthorized six years ago and signed into law by President George Bush. In that time, VAWA has saved lives by improving the law enforcement response to these crimes, protecting victims more effectively, and breaking the often intergenerational cycle of physical and sexual violence. Over the years, VAWA has continued to grow and improve, doing more to better address the needs of sexual assault victims and better serve victims from traditionally marginalized and underserved communities. VAWA programs now also address prevention and engage more stakeholders in the work to prevent and respond to violence and abuse such as healthcare providers and employers. You will hear more about these programs from our speakers. Importantly, VAWA has also been one of the great bipartisan policy successes. The trend we are thrilled has continued here today. Senators Leahy and Crapo recently introduced their version of VAWA as 1925, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. It is now scheduled to be marked up this Thursday. We are also currently working with the Judiciary <coughs> Chairman Lamar Smith and Ranking Member John Conyers on the House's version of VAWA, which we hope to see introduced very shortly. The reauthorization of VAWA cannot come at a more important and critical time. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, one in four women in this country has been a victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner, and nearly one in five women will be raped in their lifetime. Of men who report being raped, close to 30% were raped before they were 11 years old. Although VAWA has transformed our nation's response to violent crimes against women, increasing the reporting of domestic violence by as much as 51%, and reducing the number of women killed by an intimate partner, much more must be done and can be done to stop this epidemic. VAWA's successes must now reach all communities, and we need to reach out to men and women who are younger, and they are still teens and youth. They are still experiencing this violence and abuse at much higher rates than adults. In today's briefing, you'll hear from some of the leading national, state, and local experts about the positive impacts of VAWA in their communities and the urgent need for reauthorization. In the interest of time, I will introduce all of the panelists now, as well as my co-facilitator and co-moderator, Monika johnson Hostler, who will facilitate the question and answer session and close the briefing for us here today. We hope you leave today's briefing with a full understanding of the scope of VAWA programs and the services it provides. But I know I speak for all the panelists when I say that please consider us a resource. Um, we would, if there's anything that you don't know when you come out of here, please feel free to ask us. We're also happy to direct you to many of the experts in this room who may also have additional specialized knowledge. With that, I'd like to turn to our distinguished panelists. As I said, I'll introduce each one of them, and then we will begin with Grace and I'm complete. Grace Wong is attorney and a longtime advocate on behalf of victims of domestic and sexual violence. She currently serves as the policy director for the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and is a steering committee member of the Asian Pacific Islander Institute on Domestic Violence. Grace has broad expertise and is known nationally for her work on ending violence against immigrant women and their families. Judge Patricia Martin currently serves as the president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. She is presiding judge of the Child Protection Division, Circuit Court of Cook County, Illinois, and has served on the bench since 1996. She is a member and past chair of the Supreme Court of Illinois Judicial Conference Study Committee on Juvenile Justice, and a member of the Illinois <coughs> Supreme Court Special Committee on Child Custody Issues. She received her education at the University of Nairobi, Kenya, Middlebury College in Middlebury, Vermont, and the Northern Uni Illinois University College of Law. Debbie Kane is the Executive Director of the Michigan Domestic Violence Prevention and Treatment Board and currently serves as the VAWA Stock Administrator for the State of Michigan. She spent the first 15 years of her career 
as the founding executive director of Haven, Oakland County, Michigan Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Program. After leaving Haven, she served as the director of the Sexual Assault Prevention and Awareness Center at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She also has served as the director for the Violence Against Women Training Institute under the Michigan Domestic Violence Prevention and Treatment Board and is a founding member of the Michigan Coalition Against Domestic Violence. The Reverend Dr. Anne Marie Hunter. Reverend Dr. Anne Marie Hunter is the founder and director of Safe Haven's Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence. As a survivor of domestic violence herself and former employee at a battered women's shelter, Anne Marie has been working for decades to end the cycle of violence and abuse, focusing specifically on mobilizing the faith community in this effort. In 1991, she founded St. Haven's, based in Boston, Massachusetts, to improve the faith community's response to families and young people experiencing abuse by providing education, training, and resources to congregations and faith leaders in the greater Boston area. St. Haven's encourages the faith leaders to engage in prevention, earlier intervention, accountability, and social change. Monika Johnson Hostler. Monika Johnson Hostler is the Executive Director of the North Carolina Coalition Against Sexual Assault and has been working to end sexual and domestic violence for the past 15 years, both on the local and national levels. Most recently, Monika has presented and written on working with the media, sexual violence in the African American community, sexual violence in the military, and leadership development. Monika is the current board president of the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, advocating for federal policy and legislative change. She serves on multiple boards and committees, including the North Carolina Domestic Violence Commission and the North Carolina Criminal Justice Partnership. Most recently, Monika was appointed by U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder to serve on the National Advisory Committee on Violence Against Women. From the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and we are a membership program with over 70 domestic violence shelters and advocacy programs in Washington. I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Violence Against Women Act this morning, and we want to share our support from the other Washington. <laughs> Since its first initial passage in 1994, VAWA has truly reflected the, the true needs of victims. With each reauthorization, Congress has listened to input from advocates about what's working well and what areas of unmet need we continue to need attention. This reauthorization process has been no different, and we appreciate Congress's continued efforts to seek input for victims and the programs we serve. Since 1994, we've clearly seen that Bob is working. More victims feel safe coming forward to access services and to report abuse to law enforcement. The number of individuals killed by intimate partner violence has decreased by 34% for women and 57% for men. And the rate of non-fatal intimate partner violence against women has increased by 53%. There's more awareness of, about sexual assault and healthcare providers, advocates, and law enforcement have increased their ability to work together to hold the perpetrators accountable. Collaboration between victim service providers and law enforcement agencies has, in, has increased and improved as a direct result of VAWA, and yet, despite these successes, there's still a lot of work to be done. On just one day in 2011, while over 67,000 victims and their children were served by domestic violence shelter and advocacy programs across the country, over 10,500 requests for services went unmet, largely because of lack of resources. As law enforcement response to these pervasive and insidious crimes increases, victim service providers across the country have seen a corresponding increased demand for services. The Violence Against Women Act is the federal government's comprehensive effort to support victims and hold perpetrators accountable for their crimes. VAWA recognizes the need for, multi for a multidisciplinary approach to prevent and end domestic and sexual violence and appropriately provides multiple programs and gateways to services to ensure the most effective response for all victims. In Washington, my state, VAWA has supported important innovative programs that have increased the awareness of domestic and sexual violence and supported new collaborations across communities, both large and small. We've seen VAWA support the development of law enforcement agency policies on addressing domestic violence committed by law enforcement officers following a tragic homicide of the wife of the police chief in one of our larger cities in, in, in Washington. VAWA has supported our administrative office of the courts in holding forums across the state, from Vancouver to OMAC, 
to gather feedback from law enforcement officers, judges, victim advocates, prosecutors and defense and family law attorneys on how to develop protocols in reconciling multiple conflicting pro protective and no contact orders between the same parties. AWA has supported our programs in rural eastern Washington. We're working with uh, lo local wineries and fruit packing sheds and providing supports to victims of both sexual and domestic violence. The Bipartisan Lady Crapo Violence Against Women Act um, reauthorization has been introduced in the Senate and provides key improvements while strengthening victim services that are at the foundation of our nation's response to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. The bill streamlines programs, enhances the efficient use of funds, consolidating 10 existing programs into three, and reduces authorization levels by a total of 166 million in annual authorization levels compared to the 2005 bill. I'm going to talk about the 10 titles um, in the reauthorization bill. Title I focuses on the criminal justice response, which Judge Martin from the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges will discuss in greater detail. Title I ensures that all four crimes are adequately addressed in these systems, and included in this title and throughout the bill is an increased focus on victims of sexual assault, um, which continues to be underreported. The title ensures that an effective law enforcement response to domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault and stalking, and improves coordination on the state and local level. This title also includes provisions to strengthen collaboration between law enforcement and victim services providers and increases attention on effective interventions to reduce the number of domestic violence homicides. The Legal Assistance for Victims Program, which provides critically needed legal services, includes strengthened training requirements to ensure that grantees have the needed expertise to address complex legal needs of victims. Title II includes the Sexual Assault Services Program and programs to address the specific needs of victims living in rural areas and training and services for victims with disabilities and victims in their life. These services are at the foundation of our nation's response to violence and improving their supports improves the entire systematic response to violence. Specifically, Title II includes improvements to the administration of service delivery, enhances the funding formula for the Sexual Assault Services Program, and address the definition of a rural state to reflect updated population data from the 2010 census. It ensure, the rural program updates ensure that our nation's rural areas, which often have fewer resources, um, have more resources to address social service delivery barriers. Titles three and four consolidate several programs to streamline services and supports to coordinate Excuse me, supports and to coordinate um, and address the needs of youth and college age victims of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stockings. These titles also address prevention efforts and the needs of children who have been exposed to domestic violence and sexual assault. Prevention programs are a crucial component of our nation's response to these crimes and work to break the intergenerational cycle of violence. In my state and many others, our programs have been on, around long enough to see children of many former clients coming into access services. We know we need to enhance our ability to reach young people as they're just learning how to be in relationships with one another, as well as support the resiliency of children who have been exposed to domestic and sexual violence so that we can all move forward towards all our communities. We need to develop programming that will engage young people, utilizing the technology and communication methods that they use, um, as well as develop, develop age-appropriate services. Title V strengthens the healthcare system's response to these crimes. These providers provide a crucial link to services, especially when criminal legal system interventions are not the first place that people go. Title VI addresses the criti critical need for safe housing for victims by building upon <coughs> housing protections including in, included in Tufawa 2005. This bill extends these protections to victims of sexual assault and extends the wild housing protections to nine federal housing programs that are not currently covered. Oh. Title VII reauthorizes funding for the operation of the National Resource Center on Workplace Responses, which provides information and assistance to employers to develop and implement responses to domestic and sexual violence. In these challenging economic times, we hope that the House will follow the leadership of Congresswoman Glenn Albert, Allard, and Congressman Powell who had reintroduced the SAFE Act this year, which includes both the National Workplace Resource Center and ensures it available for employment insurance 
for victims. Title VIII provides essential protections for immigrant victims, including critical improvements to the U visa program. U visas are an important law enforcement tool available to non-citizen victims who have been, who have been or are likely to be helpful in criminal investigation and prosecution. In my state, which borders, shares a border with Canada and where we have a large number of high-tech workers with dependents, spouses, and children, we hear from victim advocates that victims are often fearful to seek services for fear of deportation, much less contact with law enforcement. The U visa encourages some of the most vulnerable and isolated victims to come forward and seek the assistance of the legal system to hold the perpetrators accountable, as well as seek the support of victim advocates and other services. Title IX addresses domestic and vi sexual violence against American Indian and Alaska Native women who are currently victimized at rates far higher than any other group in the country. This title provides increased tribal jurisdiction to hold perpetrators accountable and strengthen efforts to meet youth victims' needs. In my state, there are over 35 Indian tribes, including 29 that are currently federally recognized. And this title will clarify tribal jurisdiction over perpetrators um, and will help many victims in Washington State and across the country. Finally, Title X enhances the federal response to sexual assault and <coughs> federal criminal law in addressing uh, sexual abuse and custodial settings. As we move forward, we hope that the House will work to address areas of unmet needs. While 2011 and reinforces services, prevention efforts, and interventions for all groups of victims, um, meeting them where they are at in the communities, be they homeless, elders, victims with disabilities, those who are LGBT, immigrants, Jews, Native women, those in faith communities, those living in rural communities, etc. In sum, we greatly appreciate the attention that the House Judiciary Committee's leadership has given to the reauthorization of law, and we are encouraged by the focus and the diligent work on both sides of the aisle to ensure that VAWA continues to meet the needs of victims. We thank Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Congress for their commitment to this crucial life-saving legislation. Good morning. I want to begin by certainly thanking the staffers for pulling together this briefing. It's a wonderful opportunity for a judge to have the privilege and the opportunity to come to the Hill to talk about a program that works so well and has helped us so much in our court systems. Christian, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. As my mother says, the more you get introduced, the better you sound. So thank you so much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as Christian had indicated, my name is Judge Patricia Martin, and I currently am the presiding judge of the Child Protection Division of the Circuit Court of Cook County. Basically, that's the abuse and neglect courtrooms in Cook County. I also am serving as president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. This is a membership organization that is comprised of more than 1,900 judges, referees, commissioners, masters, and other juvenile and family law professionals who confront a variety of juvenile and family-related issues, including family violence. The National Council provides cutting-edge judicial edu education, training, wide-ranging technical assistance, and research to an estimated 30,000 judges and related personnel in the nation's courts. The National Council is a firm supporter of S-1925, the Leahy Cravo Violence Against Women Act, recently introduced in the Senate. I'd like an opportunity to tell you how VAWA helps to enhance court's effectiveness in family violence cases every day. VAWA-funded training brings together judges, court personnel, attorneys, victims, and advocates, child welfare personnel, all to learn the best practices for handling the needs of families in domestic violence, family, criminal, and juvenile courts. We know that domestic violence touches many families in our courts, regardless of the case type. We also know from research that child abuse and domestic violence frequently co-occur. Studies estimate that in 30 to 60,000, 60% 60 of families experiencing one form of family violence, the other is also present. Additionally, studies suggest that divorces marked by ongoing disputes over the custody and care of children. There is often a history of domestic violence in the family 
and the likelihood that the violence will continue after separation. Researchers will also tell us that adolescents who have grown up in homes where domestic violence is present are more likely to attempt suicide, abuse drugs and alcohol, run away from home or engage in other delinquent behavior, and commit sexual assault crimes. A study conducted by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention found that 70% of adolescents who lived in homes with domestic violence self-reported violent delinquency compared to 49% of adolescents from homes without this conflict. One of our signature programs is the National Judicial Institute on Domestic Violence, which has been funded by VAWA for more than a decade. The National Judicial Institute judicial training programs help our judges to use proven trauma-based responses that help the child in juvenile court who has witnessed domestic violence, while also helping the adult victim seeking a protection order in specialized domestic violence court. Judges play a critical role in the enforcement of protection orders. Judges estimate that without some types of compliance review, upwards of 75% of respondents will continue to abuse. When judges are trained in best practices around enforcing the orders they write, monitoring abusers' behavior, and holding offenders accountable, the word gets out in the community and recidivism drops. Solid research tells us that these practices save communities money in the long run in domestic violence and stalking cases. A recent report by the National Institute of Justice summarized the impact of the work of courts in Kentucky. This study found that Kentucky courts, by using and monitoring protection orders in domestic violence and stalking cases, saved the state of Kentucky $85 million in averted justice system and social system costs in just one year. Evaluation demonstrates that the VAWA funded National Judicial Institute, developed and administered by the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, partnered with Futures Without Violence and the Office on Violence Against Women, improves judicial responses to domestic violence. Approximately 500 judges who have participated in these judicial training workshops reported significant follow-up improvements in their judicial responses in local courts and communities. Two-thirds of the participants said that this judicial education provided them with the tools they needed in domestic violence cases. Almost all of the participating judges indicated that this training helped them enhance victim safety. The vast majority of judges indicated that the training helped them enhance their efforts to hold batterers accountable. The participating judges indicated that they had a better understanding of how cultural considerations factored into structuring appropriate sentences for civil remedies. The majority of judges also reported that this judicial education helped them improve their, their judicial leadership in the community. As the top leader of a local court's justice system, each judge affects the lives of thousands of community members and influences dozens of judicial system personnel annually. Think of the impact we can have on the country if we could provide all of our nation's courts with similar training and resources. Before VAWA judicial education was implemented, too many family courts simply issued emergency protective orders with no further follow-up. Now the courts that have had the benefit of VAWA's National Judicial Institute training have the tools they need to ensure that all relevant divisions of the court are engaged in keeping the community's families safe. And to illustrate this point, I'd like to tell you briefly what has happened in Cook County. Many of you are aware that Cook County is a circuit court um, that is a unified circuit court, but each one of our divisions is segregated by a building and location. So my court, the juvenile court, is located on the near west side of the city. I am the only court in that location. So my domestic violence court is actually in the loop in the city. So we're in two separate buildings separated from approximately three to four mile distance. 
What had happened prior to our training, I would issue an emergency order of protection for a family after I had an offer of proof of why it was necessary, but there was no follow-up, no enforcement of that order. The victim basically walked out of my court with a worthless piece of paper because it never went anywhere. What now happens after the training is that since the clerk's office, the presiding judge of juvenile court, the presiding judge of domestic relations, the presiding judge of the criminal division have come together, my orders now are enforced over in domestic violence court. Families are given follow-up uh, court dates, and so the order is actually followed through, and there is some collaboration amongst the divisions of our court to make certain that our victims now have attention that they need to their cases. I know that my time is running short, but if you give me just a couple more minutes. In this important recent reauthorization of VAWA, Congress has recognized the unique role of judges in helping family violence victims find safety and holding accountable those who use violence against family members. Judges provide leadership in their communities and are often the only professionals able to pull together resources from public agencies and the community. VAWA addresses the work of courts in four separate provisions, and I'll quickly go through these. First, the stop state formula grant dollars allocate 5% of the stop funding going to the states to local courts. This supports the training of judicial personnel as well as providing funding for improved court databases. Second, S1925 consolidates provisions from three existing programs by repealing two programs and rolling some of their provisions into the third existing program, thereby creating a more streamlined and cost-effective court funding program. This is an important and helpful change. Not only does it save the federal government money, but allow, it allows court ap um, applicants to apply for one rather than three grant programs, ensuring that successful applicants are able to carry out much more comprehensive work in one grant. Third, S1925 continues the reauthorization of the program providing training for court personnel on child welfare, as VAWA has done since 1994. This program is small at only $2.3 million, but it supports the work of more than 30 state courts the impact is huge. In just three of the courts participating in this program, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, federal and state government has benefited from a verdict cost totaling $1.3 billion in just one year. Fourth, the court appointed special advocates. The CASA program is a program that many of us aren't necessarily familiar with. This is a program where volunteers from our community anywhere from people working as teachers to retired businessmen come and volunteer to advocate on, on behalf of our children and victims. The program is well known for le levering thousands of volunteer hours every year to enable the court systems to address the needs of children facing abuse. This program traditionally is reauthorized in VAWA. Finally, the funds provided to help VAWA grantees implemented best practices would support the National Judicial Institute training that helps our nation's judges to enhance the safety of domestic violence victims, hold batterers more accountable, and exercise local community leadership in the struggle to end and prevent domestic, sexual, and dating violence, as well as stalking. VAWA also supports the National Council's judicial training on other community-related issues, such as the needs of immigrant victims in the courtroom. This training at the National Council offers what is commonly known to judges as U visas. Part of this judicial training addresses the U visas and educates judicial personnel about the effectiveness of U visas when getting victims to work with law enforcement and prosecution in the investigation of the case. Without new visas, courts may not hear the evidence needed for a sound and reasoned decision. Our judges believe that it is critical for local law enforcement and prosecution to be trained on how new visa processes assist with the investigation and prosecution. Finally, judges have a unique responsibility in our nation's communities. Courts are at the forefront of state and local efforts to keep families and communities safe. Without the support of VAWA courts, programs, and provisions, 
the training resources and community coordination needed to appropriately address family violence could not continue. I urge you to bring this message to the members of Congress you work for. Support the swift reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act now. My name is Debbie Kane, and I'm the Law Administrator for Michigan and a board member of AVA, the Association of Law Administrators representing 50 states and six territories. AVA wishes to thank Congress for their foresight in the creation of VAWA and the ongoing support of VAWA. And on behalf of AVA, we want Congress to know how seriously we take our fiduciary responsibility at the state level for those VAWA dollars. We see firsthand the incredible difference that VAWA makes in the lives of victims and survivors in our states, and we know how precious those dollars are and how much they have to be spent wisely. State VAWA administrators work diligently to ensure and monitor the wise expenditure of VAWA dollars in a victim-centered manner. We make victim-centered exactly that, the center of all the work that we do at the state level. State administrators also recognize the importance of ensuring that these victim-centered services must also reflect the many faces of victims and survivors in each of our states and the unique needs of each and every one of those victims who come forth for help. Especially in these difficult economic times, it's crucial that each and every dollar of VAWA is made to count. State administrators, accountability is ever present because we know that the wise use of the VAWA dollars can literally mean saving lives in our state. In preparation for today's testimony, um, we were able to poll and receive responses from over two-thirds of the AVA members in regards to some of the different initiatives that we consistently use in states as it relates to accountability, and I'd like to share some of those with you now. First of all, the state planning process, if those of you who are aware of that, involves inclusiveness of a variety of different organizations, ranging from victim service organizations, to police officers, prosecutors, law enforcement, courts, and as many different people within our communities as we can possibly um, incorporate. State planning means that truly we've looked at all of the different professions and in a multidisciplinary way are attempting to ensure that our state has developed a plan related to violence against women that in fact reflects the current and present needs of each and every state. Many of the states, including my own Michigan, also require that in order to get a ball of grant um, or contract that you must have um, a local planning process and actual signed MOUs as well. In Michigan, for instance, we require that every agency that receives VAWA dollars must participate and be part of a state multidisciplinary planning council, and that that group literally on an annual basis determines what the needs of their local community are. They develop the budget, they write the plan together, and all of the, mem all of the members of that collaborative agree and sign off on the work. One of the results that we've seen um, in relationship to that is more uniformity and collaboration. So in Michigan, for instance, um, we had a state plan for a period of time that looked at developing a bench book for judges um, on the issue of domestic violence and later sexual assault. At the same time, our Prosecutors Association was developing a guideline for the use of Michigan laws that related to prosecuting domestic and sexual violence cases and we were working on the curriculum for our police academies and in-service training. All of that was done in collaboration. All of the final products worked from one to the next so that there was a consistency of mes message and that it was multidisciplinary in being vetted. Um, therefore, for each of those final products, we had victim service people at the table, we had prosecutors, police, and all of the various um, professions represented to ensure that we were in fact working in a collaborative manner. We also look at um, the competitive bid process as one of the means of accountability. Um, VAWA administrators are a part of state government and the reality is that most state governments have a competitive bid process that we're required to follow and while it varies from state to state, nearly all states prescribe that there is a multi-level competitive bid process with a rigorous review mechanism in order for people to be awarded VAWA dollars. In most cases, that also involves, in addition to the VAWA administering agency, 
another part of the state government which looks at the contract contracting and fiscal agents and are ensuring that the state is in compliance with all state and federal rules and regulations. And finally, a review team that does the actual rating in a formalized way and is making rec recommendations, sometimes to the head of an administering agency, sometimes to the attorney general of a state or a governor or an appointed board. Um, but in general, there is a very rigorous process in order for people to be awarded follow dollars. Monitoring, quality assurance, and technical assistance, and all three of those being equally as important are a huge part of the component of accountability that we look at at the state level. Nearly all states have regularly scheduled on-site reviews of their grantee agencies. Again, Michigan as an example. We are a state governor appointed board that has legislated um, right in our enabling legislation that we're responsible for in-depth monitoring of victim service agencies in our state. That means that we literally send teams of peer monitors as well as state employees out to do a review of each of those victim service agencies. They're on site and it's something that happens over a course of anywhere from two to four days. They look at everything from board bylaws and minutes to make sure they're in compliance. They look at redacted files of information to ensure that information regarding victims and survivors is kept in an appropriate manner and that confidentiality is being honored. And they look at fiscal issues um, in addition to programmatic and other areas. A second form of monitoring that most states do is actual um, monthly um, desk audits um, where they're looking at the fiscal reports and doing risk assessment. So on a monthly basis, states are literally looking at are there problems with high turnover of staff, particularly executive or fiscal staff, the same kinds of things that you do with any contracts in a state agency. And their staff were particularly um, trained and assigned to be able to look at those things, make sure that all expenses are accountable, um, and make sure that everything is an appropriate line item. In addition to the monthly desk audits, many agencies, including our own, look at things like contract reviews, where again, we send out a team of people and we actually match up the files and statistics to make sure that the reports that go in um, actually cover all of those areas. I want to end by saying that it's equally as important to the VAWA agencies who are administering this money to ensure that grantees are getting the kind of technical assistance that they need and also ensuring that they're following best and promising practices and that they're looking at quality of services. On behalf of myself and all VAWA administrators and my colleagues at AVA, we thank you for the Congress support of these critical issues in the VAWA dollars. We share your commitment to this important work and absolutely take seriously our <coughs> charge to ensure that these precious dollars are spent wisely and accountably. Thank you. My name is Anne Marie Hunter. I'm a United Methodist pastor. I'm also the director of Safe Haven's Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence. And I think there's a little good cop, bad cop going here because I've heard a lot about how wonderful Mala is, and I'm going to get to that. But first, I want to be a bad cop for just a minute and tell you what it's like to be a victim of domestic violence in a pre vowel world, just so you'll get what it is we're talking about here. Um, because I was actually a victim of domestic violence, and I'm just realizing as we're talking about when, when VAWA was started that it was three years before VAWA that I decided to leave. Um, I think one thing that's really important for you to know is that Although I was a victim of domestic violence, I had no idea I was a victim of domestic violence. We did not have words like domestic violence or battered women or power and control. I had no idea of what was happening to me. And anyone who knew me had no idea how to help. Um, I just didn't have that kind of language. In addition, I was sure that I was the only person on the face of this earth this ever happened to. And the way I knew that was that no one ever talked about it. There was no word to describe it. There were no posters, no books, no videos, no nothing. It was nowhere. So obviously, I was the only one in the world that this ever happened to. So I was extremely alone. The first place I turned, which is the first place a lot of people turn, is to their faith community. It turned out that my husband had already talked to our priest. So when I went in to talk to the priest, he started by demanding why I had abandoned my marriage. 
He demanded to know why I had just abandoned my marriage. I tried to explain what was going on, but he said he didn't want to hear any of what was going on. He had already talked to my husband. My husband had had a religious conversion. He was a changed man. He was, this was never going to happen again, and it was now my turn to forgive and forget and go back home and make this marriage work. I didn't believe that my husband had changed, and I said that, and I, I, I said, I don't think it's safe to go home. So the priest then told me that I obviously wasn't Christian, because I didn't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit to change people. So now, right off the get-go, pre vow I am not even part of my faith community anymore. There were no shelters, so I was staying with friends. Um, the only problem is he would find out where I was staying, and then he'd be pounding on the door and calling incessantly, and my friends would politely ask me to leave because, after all, he was dangerous. But every couple of nights, I had to leave and go somewhere else. So I finally got an apartment, and one night, he was standing on the, the porch of my apartment, pounding on the door. It was really late at night. He was screaming at me through the door to let him in. And I call the police, but this is pre vowa so the police did come and they walked him around the block and 15 minutes later he was standing at my door again screaming and pounding. Um, so clearly I needed a safety plan, but we didn't have the word safety plan and there were no shelters and no hotlines, so I just made up a safety plan. What I was going to do is I figured out how long it would take him to get from pounding through my front door to my bedroom door. I had deadlocks on the inside of my bedroom door. I slept holding my phone, and I had a rope ladder at the bottom of my window that I was going to go out the second floor window with in my pajamas when he came through the front door. I'd have time to get the ladder out the window and, and run, and I didn't know where I was going to run. I hadn't really thought that through um, where I was going, but that was the safety plan. Um, yeah, there were no support groups. But a friend of mine recommended a therapist of her, so I went to see this therapist once and only once because the therapist said to me, he's Eastern European, of course he beat you, they all beat their wives. So I did, eh, that's not so helpful. Um, <coughs> there were no court advocates, and so um, I remember telling my divorce attorney some of the things that were going on. He was harassing me at work so much that my lawyer had to move my office. I told her about the incident in my apartment, how he broke in, got my unlisted phone number, blah, blah, blah. Told her all this, and she says, you know, I think you should go to court and get this order. And, you know, she, and I looked her right in the eye. I remember this. I looked her right in the eye. I said, do I have to go to court and talk about this in public? And she said, yeah, yeah, you do. And I refused. And he could kill me before I was going to go in public <laughs> and talk in front of people I don't know. You know, small town, everything, no, not happening. So, I could go on and on and on about this pre vowel world, but that's pretty much what it looked like. I left, and I was alone, unsafe, terrified, and broken. But despite the odds, I survived. Um, I healed, and I even survived after a while, and I decided to enroll um, Harvard Divinity School to learn about religion. And for the first time, I encountered other survivors, and some of them were even faithful survivors, and they all had their stories. One woman said to me that she had turned the other cheek and turned the other cheek until she ran out of faces. So in 1991, I founded Safe Haven's Interfaith Partnership Against Domestic Violence, and we, I, I founded it for those of us who have run out of faces, and there are a lot of us. We work tirelessly to educate religious leaders, rabbis, priests, imams, pastors, ministers, lay leaders, anyone who will listen, about domestic violence and how important the faith community response is. In 2003, we somehow came to the attention of the Office of Violence Against Women, which is funded by the Violence Against Women Act, and they invited us to provide national technical assistance through OVW about reaching out to faith communities and how they can be mobilized. Right now, through OVW, we're working with rural service providers to help them reach out to their local faith communities because in rural communities, faith, faith, faith communities are really central and vital. And we're also busy with a project on elder abuse and faith because it turns out that older victims also turn to their faith communities very often. Whether it's elder abuse in Cincinnati, or sexual violence in rural Sitka, or domestic violence in an immigrant community in Boston, 
Faith communities can be a life-giving access point for support, information, and referrals. And it is critical that we include faith communities at the table. That's partly because that's where victims and survivors turn for help, but particularly victims and survivors who are low-income, rural, refugee, religious, racial, and ethnic minority, and other communities. Sometimes the faith community is the only place that folks will turn for help. So now here's a glimpse of a vow world, a world that you can vote to continue, and I hope that you will. Recently, there's an Hispanic woman in Chelsea, Massachusetts, who, like me, called her priest first. She called him in the middle of the night, and she called him in the middle of a violent incident. He told me later that before training, he would have gone to her house, calmed everyone down, and made an appointment for the next morning for couples counseling. However, he had been trained with Violence Against Women Act money. So Father Ortiz told me that instead, he encouraged the victim to call the police. The police had been trained. So when they came, they arrested the perpetrator. Then the priest went to the home to support the victim. He referred her to local services, and she joined a support group. The court advocate helped her get a restraining order. Today, she is safe and free and whole. There's a long way to go to make this world a reality for everyone. Um, we are just beginning the fight against elder abuse, for example, and just beginning to be able to talk about elder abuse and faith. Yesterday, an adult protective services worker told me that he is responding to the worst physical, the worst case of physical abuse he has ever dealt with. He said that the perpetrator is an adult son and that the victim asked him to make two phone calls for her. One was to her other son and the second was to her pastor. I encourage you to bring faith communities to the table. I believe that this reauthorization bill will do that. And what I'd like to say to all of you is that on behalf of all victims and survivors, our grandmothers and grandfathers, our mothers and fathers, our sons and daughters, I exhort you, I'm in my clergy collar, I could command you, <laughs> to, to reauthorize the Violence and Women Act because we all deserve to live safe, free, and whole. Thank you. We've taken a, a journey down the world pre-VAWA, where we are now, and then all the updates that are happening um, in the Congress. So I will take a point of privilege to thank all of you um, for taking that journey with us. Some of you very familiar with the journey that are colleagues of mine, and others of you that may be hearing the journey for the first time. We are very grateful um, for the House taking on this initiative to acknowledge that it is extremely important as we move towards our reauthorization that we have the support of both chambers. Given that, I'll tell you a little bit about the National Alliance to Intentional Violence, which is the organization that I'm representing today. We represent over 56 state and territorial coalitions across the country that work to end sexual violence, and additionally, nearly 1,300 rape crisis centers throughout the country and territories who are providing direct services to sexual assault survivors as a result of all of the work that we've talked about here this morning that's happened through the Violence Against Women Act. A couple of the sexual assault priorities that have not been mentioned that I'll point out um, in hopes of not being redundant is the Rape Prevention Education Act is the first that I'll point out. It is money that actually goes to every state to ensure that our state has advocates working in school systems, in college campuses, in faith-based communities, in workplaces to really talk about how do we move towards a paradigm shift to end sexual violence. So we talk a lot about services, which is extremely important, but the rape prevention education money allows us to talk about the other side of that. So while we do want to move towards a, a community safe and free from violence, we have to begin to shift the community. We have to push the community to begin to talk about the violence that happens in our homes, in our schools, in the military, on campuses, on every aspect of our life. And to that end, we also work on the service side. 
So while we're preventing sexual violence and domestic violence, we're also clear and obvious that we must continue the work to provide intervention and crisis services to the survivors that come forward, but also those who don't have the language necessarily to talk about what, is, what they're experiencing, but they're able to hear us because the Violence Against Women Act allows us to not only have the language, but also to have the platform to be loud and clear in our voice and our messages around moving towards a community that's safe for all people. Um, given that, I'll also talk a little bit about the underserved community. So we've talked about faith, we've talked about elder, but that is such a plethora of people that we're hoping to continue to provide services and outreach so that there are no barriers to anyone coming forward to seek services, nor to be a part of this movement to really move us towards the paradigm shift that we've been talking about here today. And you've heard also some of the other bills that are in the House. We want to thank all of you that work for members that are already moving forward on those specific pieces of legislation that Kirsten mentioned, but most importantly, we want to continuously thank Congress for the bipartisan support that we have had for the last iterations of VAWA, and we only expect, or shall I say, um, as the Reverend Doctor said, command that we continue to have the bipartisan support, and we want to thank personally at this point, um, my point of privilege here is to thank both Ron LeBrand and Sarah Allen from both the chairmen. Um, Smith's office and ranking member Collier's office for supporting the task force as we continue to move forward to talk about this openly and publicly. I will close by saying that we are sure that you will return to your offices to talk about the importance of swiftly reauthorizing VAWA. You have heard the importance of it from the victims all the way to systems, and that's the breadth and depth of VAWA. It does not just work directly to, with victims, but it's also the collaboration and partnership to ensure that across the state that we're making systems change, across this nation we're making systems change. So as you leave this room, please be sure to remember that the website that you can also check for information is the number four, VAWA.org, and it will keep you updated on all the information as it relates to VAWA reauthorization, but also all the other bills that are coming up that are taking pieces of VAWA as we move forward. And thank you for your time.